Prayer is essential to the life of every Christian. It is that communication with God that gives you peace, resilience, and fullness. Yet at the same time, we often neglect to spend time with God in prayer. It is our hope here at TLN that you find that time for God so that you may grow closer to Him and so that you may discover more of how you can exercise your faith in the world around you. Today, TLN presents Dr. Bill Thrasher, professor at Moody Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. As a teacher, author, and speaker, his heart is for the soul of the believer. May you be blessed and challenged as he speaks on giving God your first fruits. It's a delight to be with you today, and I'd like to talk to you about how do you return to Christ as your first love. That's what Jesus rebuked the church of Ephesus about in Revelation 2. And how do you overcome that condition that our Lord called lukewarmness, that was nauseating to Him, that He talks about to the church of Laodicea? You know, there was a number of years ago, a Christian leader shared with me how he had taken the principle of first fruits and applied that to his time. And this was many, many years ago he was relating this to me. This is actually in the spring of 1982. And he mentioned how he had taken the principle of first fruits and as he had applied that to his time, as he had given the first, of, first few moments of his day to God, as he sought to honor the Lord with the first day of the week, the Lord's day. And also he talked about giving the first part of a year to the Lord. Now that was the concept that was the most foreign to me. But you know, when the next year came around, uh, I'd, I'd remember that conversation. And I'd written in my daytimer, okay, when January of 1983 comes around, I don't know exactly what it means, but I'm going to give the first part of the year to you. Well, I uh, was single at that particular time. I remember going through a number of my belongings and getting rid of things I really didn't need, and that helped a little bit. I remember looking over some past journals I'd taken over the years, and three things sort of began to come to the surface. And so the idea came to my mind, why don't you go into this year trusting God for these three specific things that year? Well, that was a very, very special year spiritually. And so, you know, when the next year came around, I said, God, I'm going to do the same thing. I'd never had that kind of direction uh, for a year in that way. And so I asked God, God, what are the three things you want me to trust you for for, for, for this year? Well, I've done that each year uh, since 1983. There's nothing magic about the number three, but that's about as many as I think I can handle. And so I, I try to keep, uh, be attentive to the Lord in regard to what I'm learning in regard to those things as I lift those things up to Him in expectancy. Well, one year, I believe the year was 1990, I asked the Lord, Lord, how could I be used of you to raise up prayer among your people? Well, I laid that before the Lord for a year. And you know, at the end of that year, I, I felt like God had given me one insight. Now that looked very sparse. You know, I felt like a person could trust God for an afternoon and, and uh, they could learn more than one thing. But you know, that one thing is what I'd like to talk to you about today. And that has probably raised up more prayer in my life and thousands of other people than any other thing I know. You see, I thought God would maybe just flood me with strategies of how to raise up prayer, and I think at that particular time in my life it would just produce a lot of works of the flesh. But the one thing God showed me was this. Tell God's people how to make use of their needy moments. You see, the wrong thought in my mind that needed to get uprooted was this. The thought I lived with was this. Lord, one day, I'm going to be strong enough and disciplined enough and whatever else enough to be a man of prayer. Well, not only has that day never come, but see, that idea is the very antithesis of prayer. Prayer, in the words of the Norwegian O'Hallisby, the petition aspect of prayer, prayer is helplessness plus faith. You know, helplessness plus faith. I remember writing down these words that year. I looked at them this morning was before I was uh, going to be speaking here. And, 
And I remember writing down the words, don't be anxious because of your helplessness and your distress. It's the power of your prayer life. You see, you can even stumble over that, helplessness plus faith, unless you understand what faith is. Faith is coming to Jesus with your helplessness. Now let's say maybe you were putting together a very complicated jigsaw puzzle and you had your little three-year-old there with you. Would you expect the three-year-old to say, now, Daddy or Mommy or Granddaddy or Grandmommy, now I want you to put this little piece here? No, you would be just delighted that they were with you and if they just threw the pieces in your lap, that would be just fine. Sometimes that's about all we know to do with God in regard to our helplessness. Helplessness plus faith. See, tell God what you lack. Tell God what others lack. You see, when our Lord set His love upon us, when our Lord set His love upon us, He says He loved us, and it describes our condition in four ways. One of the ways it describes our condition there in Romans 5, 6, it says He loved us when we were helpless. You see, when you come to Christ for salvation, in the words of Romans, your mouth had to be shut. You have no arguments to give Him. You have nothing to produce. You're, all your righteousness amounts to nothing, but you look totally to Jesus for your salvation. He says that attitude is something you never graduate from. As you received Him and found Him totally sufficient for your salvation, so you look to Him at this moment for whatever the needs are in your life. You look to Him and to experience His adequacy at this moment. Colossians 2, 6. As you received Him, so walk in Him. Well, make use of your needy moments. Make use of your needy moments. The story is of the former heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. If you're old enough, you remember him when he first came out as Cassius Clay. But Muhammad Ali is how he's known to the world today. And he was riding on an airplane. And the pilot was continually given the instructions, you need to buckle your seatbelt, you need to buckle your seatbelt. And he just ignored it. And finally, the stewardess came over there to him, told him, you need to buckle your seatbelt. Which he replied, Superman don't need no seatbelt. Which he replied, Superman don't need no airplane. Well, God has ways in all of our life to show us that we're not Superman. He, you say, okay, well, be specific. What do you mean, make use of your needy moments? Well, you see, when there's fear in your life, the psalmist says, I sought the Lord and He delivered me from my fear. You see, if there's fear in my life and I'm talking to God and I'm not telling Him about that fear, I'm not praying. There's a lot of things done in the activity of prayer that's not prayer. And that would cause you to despise this wonderful activity of prayer. Because it's not just an activity, it's a way that you can share your heart with God. When you are anxious, when you're anxious, uh, God says every time you're tempted to be anxious, that's God tapping you on the shoulder and say, I want you to talk to me, Philippians 4, 6. The God of the universe commands you at this moment, He commands me to be anxious for nothing. Every time you're tempted to be anxious, he says, God's stirring us to have a conversation with him. He says, talk to me. Sometimes you have to talk to him about what's causing you to be anxious. What, Lord, what is I'm anxious about? He also tells us to supplicate him, to petition him. Tell me what you want me to do about your concern. And he also says, don't forget to thank me. See, it's Thanksgiving that connects us to God. Sometimes you can talk about your anxiety and, and you get wrapped more, about, more wrapped up in that than in God. Um, you know, I cannot imagine a godlier lady than the name Elizabeth Elliot. She's with the Lord now. I had the privilege of being in a prayer meeting with her granddaughter, her namesake. And now that Elizabeth is working with her husband in England as a missionary. Well, you remember Elizabeth Elliot, of course, when her husband was, was martyred and she had her little baby, uh, Valerie, uh, and she heard the news of her husband being martyred. And I've heard her tell the story a number of times. And she said, her next thought was, oh God, how can I reach those Aka Indians? She knew that was the driving force. That was a driving force of her, of her husband. And now, as I heard that, the last time I heard that, I just wept. I wept, one, because I probably knew that was the last time that she would have a public ministry as she came there to speak at the school I teach at. 
But also I wept. I said, Lord, do I know Christianity? I thought that you'd sort of pin a medal of honor on somebody if they thought about, okay, God, I'm going to have to make it as a single mother. And Lord, how can I make it as a single mother without a husband and raise this baby? And, and, and that's not illegitimate thinking. But, but her thought is, oh, God, how can I reach those Aka Indians? You know, she gave a kind endorsement of the, of the prayer book I wrote, A Journey to Victorious Praying. And I hope this makes you think more of her. It certainly should. Here's the way she describes herself, this godly, godly lady. As a born worrywart like my father, I've had to learn to seek his face to find strength. I will hardly agree with Dr. Thrasher that in God's kindness, he instructs us how to process our anxiety. I pray this book blesses many. As a born worrywart, as a born worrywart. Now, I cannot imagine a godlier lady, but to, there's nothing wrong with her telling us where she finds her strength. And her father was a godly, godly man. There's nothing wrong with her telling us where does she find her strength. Well, uh, processing your fear, your anxiety. You see, at this moment, what fear and what anxiety do you need to talk to God about? That's God calling you into conversation with Him. He cares like no one else. He cares. Uh, what fear and anxiety? Make use of your needy moments. How about when there's guilt in your life? God says, talk to me. One of the most freeing verses in the Bible to me is 1 John 1, 7. It says, as we walk in the light, as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. My friend, are you in the light at this moment? Are you walking openly, honestly, and transparently before God? It's the opposite of covering your sin. God gives you a promise if you cover your sin. He who covers his sin shall not prosper. That's a promise. It's just as true as the law of gravity. But God says if you walk open and honest and transparent before me, the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses you from all sin. You know, how about another needy moment when you're being tempted? You know, if, if you take your temptation and you turn those into conversation with God, you won't get in trouble. And you'll talk to God from your heart. You know, what makes a temptation a temptation is this. It appeals to some legitimate need in your heart to meet in an unrighteous way. And God says, talk to me about that temptation. You know, King David, uh, an incredible man, called a man after God's own heart. As you read those first chapters in 2 Samuel, as you read chapters 1 to 10, you aren't prepared for chapter 11. You would never think that was what would happen. He's stellar the way he responds to, to King Saul and doesn't retaliate. And, but then in that moment of weakness, when he had that idle moment and he saw that beautiful woman, and you know the story there in 2 Samuel 11. If not, you can read it. And he looked and lusted and, found a way to get to that woman and committed adultery. Fear struck him, and then he found a way to cover that up with the murder of her husband. He covered that sin, and he lived in agony. Psalm 32 talks about that, that agony. It just sucked the life out of him. And, but God sent Nathan to rebuke him there in 2 Samuel 12. And when Nathan rebuked him, he gave him these words, and I want you to hear this when you're being tempted. And I want you to see how real God can be with you in your, in your temptation. You see, he told, he told King David, David, I did this for you. I gave you the kingdom. I gave you your wives. I did give you this, and, and I gave you this. And if that had been too little, I have many more things like this to give you. But now, David, why have you now despised me? I'm quoting from 2 Samuel 12, verses 7 and following. And he says, David, why have you despised me and done this despicable thing? In other words, he's saying, David, I understand. I understand how you felt when you looked at that beautiful woman. I understand it. I made a man, I made a, made a woman. I understand that. And David, that thirst in your heart, why didn't you come to me? I understand that. If Jesus said, if any man's thirst, let him come to me and drink. But why did you drink out of these polluted wells? David, I knew what you were feeling when you had this great fear in your heart and you wanted to cover it up. 
David, why didn't you come to me with that fear? That's what God's saying to you as you're tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. I ask you to come boldly to that throne of grace. I remember a, a precious student of mine sharing this story, gave me permission to share it. I've never shared his name, but he said he was struggling with an ungodly habit in his life. And he was asking God, would you deliver me from that ungodly habit? Well, um, he still had the ungodly habit. There, there was a discerning, loving man of God that came up to him, he said one day. He says, why are you asking God to deliver you from that ungodly habit? You love that ungodly habit. You don't really want God to answer that prayer, do you? He said, that was the absolute truth. And one of the most humbling things he ever did was to come to God and say, God, I'm totally ashamed of this. But Lord, I love this ungodly habit. I really don't want you to deliver me from it. You know what else he told me? That was the beginning of breaking the ungodly habit. You see, it's that little testimony that shared with me and taught me how to experience Hebrews 4.16. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Come with freedom to the throne of grace. That meant a lot to me, but how do you come boldly when you're thinking the wrong thing and you know you're thinking the wrong thing? How do you come boldly when you have the wrong attitude? And you know you have the wrong attitude. It's meaning what it means to, understanding what it means to come boldly. To come boldly means to come with freedom. When that brother came with freedom to the throne of grace, saying, God, I'm ashamed of this, but Lord, I love this ungodly habit. What happens? Hebrews 4, 16 says, you experience mercy, sympathetic understanding in your weakness, and find grace to help in time of need. Come to God in your temptation. Those are needy moments. But you pray that way, taking your fears, your anxieties, your guilt, your temptations, and you'll learn to delight in prayer. You see, really all of life is a needy moment. Uh, if Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, <laughs> John 15, 5. The theologian John Calvin called prayer the discipline of our weakness. You and I would like to pray out of our pride. As if, Lord, I've got it together. Now, Lord, I want you to whip everybody else in shape. But you know, that is the antithesis of prayer. Uh, God works through our weakness. He's mighty in our weakness. And that's true even in regard to our prayer life. And you say, well, what happens when I feel inadequate and I feel unworthy to come to the Lord? You know, I appreciated so much the testimony of a pastor. And this pastor, he said it had been a horrible day. And he was trying to pray at the end of that day. As he tried to pray at the end of that day, uh, he said it was a struggle all the way. And he said it was a struggle all the way. And, and uh, he thought to himself, Lord, um, what happens if I'd, if I'd led somebody to Christ today? I wouldn't have any problem praying. What if I'd spent some meaningful, meaningful time meditating on your word? I don't think I'd have a problem praying. But Lord, that's not the kind of day I had. I had a terrible day. And he says it was then that he felt a rebuke from God. You know, your problem, pastor, is this. You want to come to me in your name and not in Jesus' name. You know, uh, when you feel inadequate, when you feel unworthy, come in Jesus' name. Come in his authority. You know, he shed his blood to earn every blessing of heaven for you and me. I will never deserve that. You will never deserve that. But I'm to humble myself and allow him to be gracious to me. You're to humble yourself and allow him to be gracious to you, maybe even at this moment in, where you may feel inadequate or you may feel unworthy. Would you come to God in Jesus' name? That is prayer and using your weakness to help you. You know, let me tell you a way of God, a way of God. God, remember Moses prayed, teach me your ways that I may know you. A way of God is this, that God wins his victories in the midst of apparent defeat. You see, uh, in that times of apparent defeat, uh, where you feel like giving up, you feel like despairing, God brings us low to cry out to him. You know, that principle is as biblical as the death and resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus was crucified and laid in the tomb, it looked like, apparent defeat. It looked like the enemies of wickedness had won. But oh, God was winning his very greatest victory. And after that came the resurrection. 
God wins his victories. Now, I don't know what you're going through at this moment, but there may be some apparent defeat. There may be those fiery darts of despair that are being thrown at you. And God wants you, maybe you need the help of others, and we're willing to help you right now and pray that God would strengthen you to cry out to God. I remember the testimony of the dear uh, individual. He's greatly been used in racial reconciliation, John Perkins. He was saved in, uh, I think, his late 20s. I think he had only a second or third grade education formally. And I remember him sharing this with me that he said, you know, when he was given a Bible for the first time in his life, he so yearned to understand and, and, and receive a biblical education in regard to be taught of God. He said, the most frustrating thing in the world, he says, Lord, I'm not sure I've got the mental equipment to, to digest it. But he said, I cried out to God, oh God, if you would just open up this book, I'll do anything to declare it. I don't think anybody would argue that God answered that prayer. It may be that every sentence wouldn't have perfect English. I said he had a second or third grade formal education, but he has seven honorary doctorates. He wrote a kind blurb. He says, praying was a personal inspiration. He says, the book was a personal inspiration to me, and I hardly recommend it to the whole church and anyone who desires to bring their prayer life to a new level. That's a man who knows how to pray. See, God, if you would cry to God in those moments that it's so easy to despair, God will honor that. You know, let me share with you something that I think you can readily use, something that every day of your life will help you. And I think if the people listening will adhere to what I'm saying now, I think only God can know the impact of it. And it is simply this. This was some 30 years ago that I remember this dear man on the West Coast, he was leading a number of people to Jesus from some very hard backgrounds. And here's what he told them. He says, now that you've come to Christ, you're going to be tempted to go back to some of those wrong choices. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask God to give you a prayer request, a prayer burden, that every time you're tempted to go back to that wrong choice, I want you to take it as a prompting to pray this prayer. He says, let it be a prayer that will damage Satan's kingdom as God answers it. It's no more complicated than that. It took me a while to work that in my life, and I don't know why I did. I've shared this with thousands of people. In fact, if uh, we can't do this here in TV land, but I've had students in my class. I say, okay, I want you to write down your most persistent temptation. Write down your most persistent temptation. Not a sin to be tempted. Write it down. And before I let you leave, I'm going to ask you to every time you're tempted in that way, how are you going to respond in prayer? What prayer request is that going to prompt you to pray? Think of every time a man was tempted to th have an impure thought. He prayed for the purity of his children. Think of every time you were tempted to be discouraged. You prayed for the encouragement of your Christian leaders. You know, I know in my weakness, I am prompted to pray for people and I can identify them in compassion in ways that I would not. Uh, can you grab a hold of that? I beg of you to act upon it. I beg of you to do not go to bed tonight without doing it, writing down your persistent temptation and writing down how you're going to respond to it. You may consider being in a prayer partnership with somebody. So, you know, every time I'm tempted, I'm going to pray for you. Every time you're tempted, you pray for me. You see, when there is that great battle, there are those evil days. Scripture says, stand firm, be strong in the Lord in the day of evil. There are those evil days where sometimes your greatest goal is just to survive the day. But in those moments, you can cry out to God in your weakness, and God can hear you. I tell you, that helps me every day of my life. I pray that you can grab a hold of that. I pray also that it would help you. You know, the psalmist says, When thou dost say, Seek my face, my heart said to thee, Thy face, O God, I shall seek. God is telling you, when you feel like you're in a very intense battle, to seek his face. It's almost counterintuitive. You see, there's a way of trying to resist temptation. 
and you get more wrapped up in the temptation. This is a way of using the temptation to become a motivation to do a godly thing. Use the temptation to prompt you to pray. Could we close in prayer as you would join me with all the others, people listening to this, that God would meet them in their needy moments, in their fears, their anxieties, their temptations, and even their persistent temptations, that they could learn to turn those into believing intercessory prayer for others. Join me as we pray. Father, in Christ's name, we pray in agreement. Uh, the name that's above every name, the name that all authority in heaven and earth has been given. And we ask God that you meet each one, Lord, in their needy moments, all the days of their life. And God, would you meet us in our persistent temptations and train us to turn those into effective intercession. Be strong in our weakness for the glory of Christ. Amen. Thank you very, very much. And God bless you. I hope you take Dr. Bill Thrasher's words to heart. And may you find God in your needs, fears, anxiety, and temptations. Once Abraham Lincoln said, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for that day. Is that you? Seek God and give Him your heart. The book of Psalms says, The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. We here at TLN love you. Contact us so we may join with you in prayer. Jesus loves you. God bless.